This broadcast of OPF Radio on February 4th of 2013 is about martial law. Gary Hunt is the guest, and your host is Libby Salsa. And that was Ashley Alicize's A Dangerous Situation. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. You are listening to Outpost of Freedom Radio. It has been a common fear amongst those within the Patriot community that with the growth of the American police state, it was only a matter of time until a condition of martial law was overtly enacted. However, does it really benefit the enemy rebel government to place Americans en guard in order to push their tyrannical agenda? Are military checkpoints laced with Constantina wire filled with armed soldiers asking for your papers really a realistic expectation? Or is perhaps the entire notion of a governmentally imposed martial law simply a myth? Now, with that said, let us turn to our guest. Gary, are you with us? Yes, I am. Good evening, Sleepy. Good evening. All right, well, let's just go ahead and jump into it. Gary, what is martial law? Well, by definition, martial law, named after the god of war, Mars, uh, is, it pertains to war or military. Uh, there's some interesting historical quotes, uh, dictionary-type quotes that talk about it, but in every case, it's has to do with a, a military government being put in place. So it's not uh, a civil government, rather a military government, or what happens a lot in South America or other countries in the world where uh, military actually uh, rules partially, temporarily, and martial law tends to be temporary. And uh, so it's got a specific definition, and that's kind of what we're going to talk about tonight. All right, well, why is the Patriot community so concerned about martial law? Well, I'm not quite sure. I've seen the, the term bantered around so much. Some people claim we've been under martial law since the Civil War. Uh, others use the War Powers Act of uh, 1917 and the subsequent revisions to it in 19, I think, 33. Uh, to claim we're in martial law. In fact, I wrote an article, it was called Martial Law Question Mark, and it had to do with uh, the doing away with the gold standard, which uh, some people were, were suggesting was martial law. Uh, but martial law is kind of the word, phrase that's used to define a line in the sand where when they declare martial law, uh, pick up my rifle, and we're going to town. And so it becomes, well, say a benchmark, uh, the, the starting point, SHTF day, shit hits the fan day. Um, everybody expects it to come. It's, gonna, it's going to happen. But, you know, this, again, that's what the program's about tonight. Is it really going to happen? Are we going to see a declaration of martial law? Okay, well, first things first, why is martial law dangerous? Well, martial law in itself isn't dangerous. Uh, violation of the uh, prescribed rules uh, under martial law can be because it does dispense with the judicial uh, or due, due process aspects of law that uh, punishment can be arbitrary for looting or anything else. It can be implemented in almost any manner. It, uh, it's dictatorial in its nature, and as I say, it's under military authority, so you, all the civil elements of government are set aside uh, with martial law. So if it were declared, it, it, put, it potentially is dangerous for any violations of martial law, and I would say that very possibly assassinations would be covered up by... Uh, misreporting the circumstances that occurred. And 
you know, I'm not going to say it was martial law in, uh, um, during Katrina in New Orleans, but uh, the police, the civil element, did cover up some things, apparently, and they're being found out now. But things can happen, and in martial law, there would be less scrutiny than there was in New Orleans. So it can be dangerous, but it's not dangerous just because it exists. It's dangerous uh, the, the two reasons, one, if you violate the, the rules that are laid out, and number two, is it gives an abusive authority to uh, uh, people that uh, might be prone to, to take advantage of their power. All right. Well, why is martial law different from our current situation? Well, our current situation, we have... Uh, really no military, uh, any semblance of military governance in this country. You know, it would be a violation of the Posse Comitatus Act. That doesn't mean that it couldn't be imposed on us, but um, in fact, there's no martial law in place in this country today. Um, in fact, interestingly, the Constitution doesn't even make provision for martial law. Uh, there are three provisions in the Constitution that might address that's the point, and uh, they are Article 1, Section 8, Clause 15, to provide for calling forth the militia to execute the laws of the Union, suppress insurrection, and repel invasion. Now, that would be, in a sense, a limited martial law if they were called in to execute the laws of Union, suppress an insurrection, or repel, uh, well, repel invasion would not be martial law necessarily. Article 1, Section 9, Clause 2, the privilege of the writ of habeas corpus shall not be suspended unless when in cases of rebellion or invasion, the public safety may require it. In Article 4, Section 4, Clause 1, the United States shall guarantee to every state in this union a republican form of government and shall protect each of them against invasion or on application of the legislature or the executive when the legislature cannot be convened against domestic violence. So those are the only three provisions in the Constitution that specifically allow for a declaration of emergency that could be uh, uh, verging on, on martial law. It wouldn't be uh, a complete martial law with, with, the, with the, uh, the common sense in the patriot community as it would be very limited. Huh. Now, this is interesting. Uh, one of the uh, listeners from the chat room is basically saying that uh, I have heard, I believe it is T.N. Rose says, I hear we have been under martial law since 1933. Well, what happened in 1933 is the War Powers Act was revised and two things happened. Uh, a provision from the 1917 War Powers Act, which made it applicable to... Uh, uh, People other, quote, other than citizens of the United States, end quote. And in 1933, it was changed in that other than citizens of the United States was removed from it. But the implementation then, and that had to do with war powers, uh, it also allowed confiscation of gold. It denied uh, due process in gold. It uh, made, uh, well, interesting, uh, it made... Uh, testimony on your own behalf compulsory. You had to answer questions, so due process was set aside in dealing with gold. Um, so certain things were set aside. Now, the question in the article that I wrote, which um, is number one, uh, martial law, question mark, had to do with changing the currency of the United States in violation of the Constitution, which requires that these uh, as states shall uh, accept nothing but gold and silver uh, for payment of debt. Uh, so it wasn't really martial law. I mean, a lot of people back in the 90s talked about it uh, as if it were martial law, but it doesn't meet the standard or the criteria that is uh, necessary to satisfy the definition of martial law. It was a suspension of a provision of the Constitution. In fact, in 1970, uh, when 1973, let me find it real quick. Uh, the Senate did a report on suspension of uh, 
Senate Report Number 93-549, November 19, 1973. And they determined since March 19, uh, 9, 1933, the United States has been in a state of declared national emergency. In fact, there are now four presidentially proclaimed states of national emergency. In addition to the national emergency declared by President Roosevelt in 1933, there are also the national emergency proclaimed by President Truman on December 6, 1950, during the Korean conflict and the state of national emergency de uh, declared by President Nixon on March 23, 1970, and August 15, 1971. So there were four provisions, uh, declarations of national emergency. However, none of them implemented military authority within the United States, within the country. So they were national emergencies, and they were declared under the provisions Loose interpretation of the Constitution, but they are not martial law. So the misconception is uh, to assume that when the government declares an emergency, remember Korea was the first non-declared war in this country, so it was a national emergency that had nothing to do with our nation, but had everything to do with South Korea. Uh, so they declared an emergency to give them the authority to send troops over there to uh, to fight a war that in violation of the Constitution. But again, it's not martial law. It's only a misnomer to call it that. All right, well, let's let's try to further clarify it then. Is martial law the same as a police state? Not if we look at the de uh, distinction between the definitions of the two. A national emergency, for example, gold was leaving this country, according to McFadden, tons were being shipped out of New York Harbor every day. That led to the declaration of a national emergency, which gave the president, Roosevelt, complete control uh, over uh, disposition of gold in this country. All gold was turned in. Uh, theoretically, jewelry had to be turned in in some cases, but all gold coin had to be turned into the government because they didn't want it leaving the country. That was a national emergency because if the gold left the country, we would have nothing but Federal Reserve notes to spend in this country. Boy, it didn't work, did it? Um, at any rate, it was a national emergency to stop a problem that had occurred. So, uh, again, back to uh, the Korean War, there's no authority in the Constitution, but the national emergency declared by Truman allowed us to fight a war without declaring war. And even though there, were not, uh, there was not one initially in Vietnam, there was one subsequently by Nixon in 1970 uh, to allow us to violate the Constitution and remain in Vietnam. But mil back again to martial law. <laughs> martial law is where a military government is put in place of the civilian government. A good example and we'll talk about this a little more later, would be the reconstruction period in World War, uh, after, after the war between the states. Uh, reconstruction created five military districts in 10 of the 11 seceding states, and they were absolutely under martial law at that time. They did not call it mas monar uh, martial law. They called it reconstruction, but in fact, it met all the criteria of the definition of martial law where a military governor was the ultimate executive authority, and the only thing that he could not do is approve an execution without uh, specific uh, authority uh, in each case from uh, the War Department uh, in Washington or the president. So the a... it, one is a kind of a band-aid, the other one is a cast. The Band-Aid is flexible and is for a small injury. The cast is rigid and, and it encompasses large parts. So, you know, we need to think that way and understand that martial law has characteristics that do not fit this normal situation that people allude to with regard to 1933 and things like that. There was a term you used. Uh, I believe it was national emergency. In the, for the purpose of clarity, is this national emergency the same thing as martial law? 
No, not at all, because it's still under civil authority. The national author- uh, the na- national emergency from 1933, for example, uh, gave the authority to the Treasury Department, the FBI, and various agencies of government, non-military, not Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, Coast Guard, uh, to do s- certain functions. Uh, this is true as well when an emergency is declared, uh, say, during Katrina. It, the military didn't go in. The National Guard went in, but the National Guard was under the authority of the governor of the state, and they were there to, uh, it, it, that's not, they weren't, did not replace the civil government. They supplemented the civil government. So, um, we don't have the, the context where the military is actually in power uh, in a national emergency. And like I say, the national emergency, emergencies can be declared uh, for various reasons in the Constitution. But the distinction has to be understood that one is military control. The military authority is God. They make the decisions. There is no judicial branch. There is no legislative branch. The laws are enacted by the military or a higher authority. They're enforced by, and there are no judicial proceedings unless they decide to allow judicial proceedings. What is the role of the police during martial law? If martial law were declared, it is quite possible, because we saw this happen in Waco, even though it wasn't military, that the Waco Police Department, the McLennan County Sheriff's Department, the Texas Rangers, the Texas State Police in that area were all deputized by the Department of Justice. Uh, Presumably, they could be deputized by the military if martial law were declared, uh, since they have been given military equipment anyway. Uh, so they, they could supplement it, but they would, if, if for it to be martial law, those policemen, the sheriffs, and anybody that was deputized would be under the absolute authority of the military, a general officer in the military uh, as his senior. Is there a difference between soft and... I guess you could say hard martial law. Well, uh, I'm not sure what the what is meant by soft and hard, but I would say soft would be a, probably a, a martial law just to keep a little bit of order uh, where things were getting out of hand and it was necessary for one reason or another to institute military uh, authority uh, over an area uh, for whatever reason. Um, but would be probably almost unnoticeable, uh, where hard martial law would be the rigid one, where there were checkpoints, there were doors being broken down, um, and uh, absolute military authority with a total disregard for any civil laws that had been enacted. How do you determine if you live under a condition of martial law? I think that it would be quite apparent, as it was in the South, that people were identified by the military districts. They had to sign in, get their papers. Uh, The regimentation that would come under martial law would be the same regimentation that was in uh, in effect in World War II in Europe, for example, when we went into France. Uh, and especially to Germany, everybody had to register with the military authorities. They were told what they could and couldn't do. Uh, you would see tanks. You would see troops all the time. You'd probably see bivouac areas since they can't quarter them in houses um, based on the Bill of Rights. Uh, it, it would be very apparent that the military was in control of the situation, and I would expect that uh, regardless of you, if you'd done anything wrong or not, you would be a little apprehensive walking down the street. How would martial law be declared? By the Constitution, it would require the legislative branch of government, the Congress, to declare martial law. Now, the president however has uh 
declared national emergencies. But and so we we really don't have a test. Reconstruction came out of the Congress. Um, the president did declare martial law in Washington D.C. The uh, only in Washington D.C. Uh, the Congress did not object, at least from what I found in researching that period. The Congress did not object, but since Washington, D.C. falls under Article 1, Section 8, Clause 17 of the Constitution, uh, it's not treated as a state. But there was concern during the Civil War. In fact, Washington, in, the, in many of the books I've read recently, uh, there were more military by far than there were civilian people in Washington, D.C. They were uh, bivouacked in, in vacant lots and everything. But with the exception of that, the only uh, thing that approaches martial law in this country would be what uh, occurred in the South during Reconstruction. Why would the government not declare martial law? Now, if we if we're looking at you know the current period where everybody's talking about the government's going to declare martial law, and this is where it becomes apparent that we won't see a declaration of martial law. Uh, there are countries pretty much divided between uh, I hate to use the terms Democrats and Republicans. Um, Republicans being generally on the side that most of the patriots are, the Tea Party, the Ron Paul supporters and all that. We're seeing those lines tending to evaporate now in a readjustment going on, but you've got equal sides. Now, if they declared martial law, all the people on the conservative side would be outraged that the government saw fit to do that. They would be apprehensive that they would be arrested because they oppose the government in power, uh, which would force them, leaving them no alternative, would force them to make the determination that it's time to pick up a rifle and, and fight back against the government. So a declaration of martial law would be what the patriot community has been expecting when they declare martial law, I'm going to pick up my rifle and we're going to go do it. And uh, so it would be a mistake to declare martial law because that would create open warfare, basically, in this country, uh, because we still have a lot of the pride that carried us through a couple of centuries, and I don't believe we would submit to it. So it would be bad tactic to say, the, the, to be not kind. It would be a bad tactic to declare martial law. Now, what's the alternative to that? The alternative, alternative is the expansion of the police state. And we've seen that going on for quite some time. Watching the news tonight, for some reason, the Federal Bureau of Investigation was in charge of what was happening, even though the spokesman was the sheriff. They, they were basically in charge of what was happening in southern Alabama with this guy that had taken a five-year-old kid hostage and put him, put him in a container, uh, you know, an underground bunker. Um, <laughs> The, and the hostage rescue kit team then went in and killed the sniper, or killed the guy, Dykes. Um, there is no federal jurisdiction there, but we're seeing the police state, and we saw it in Waco where the FBI and the BATF and the U.S. Marshal Service and all these people went down in Texas where they had no jurisdiction and set up camp. They got some military equipment from Fort Hood and set up camp around Mount Carmel Center. Uh, we're seeing a conditioning going on in this country where we more and more accept that the federal government has no jurisdiction and we don't challenge it. Now, I'll give you an example, jurisdiction regarding kidnapping. It was called the Mann Act. I don't remember the year it was enacted, but it was a federal enactment that if you kidnapped a minor and transported them across state lines, it became a federal matter. The Lindbergh kidnapping had no federal jurisdiction. It was all done by the New York state troopers, state police. Uh, but now we see the federal government going in foreign countries, uh, and states in a sense are foreign countries to them. So this is uh, an expansion of a police state. Now let's look at Germany back in the 30s and 40s. They never declared martial law, but that 
ominous police state kept encroaching on the rights of the people to the point that churches had to preach what they were told to preach, that people had to do what they had to do, and by having a religion you could be arrested. But there was never a declaration of martial law or anything like it. It was always civilian policemen that did the damage, and that's what we can expect here, just an expansion of the police state. And Let's compare it to the proverbial frog. Uh, declaring martial law would be throwing the f frog in boiling water and watching him jump back out. But the encroaching police state is when you put him in cool water and bring the water temperature up until it's boiling, and he doesn't realize it's coming. So if we put this line in the sand of police state, or martial law, we're fooling ourselves, we're look, watching the right hand while the left hand is slowly boiling the water around us. Interesting. All right. Well, has, Cong has Congress ever declared martial law? To my knowledge, I have not been able to find any point that they ever declared martial law using those terms. But let's go back to Reconstruction. And let's go back to some situations in the West where Indian uprisings were uh, taking place. They had the, uh, the Indian uprisings had the appearance of martial law, and the cavalry, when it moved into areas where there were serious uh, uh, Indian problems, would actually take over local government, uh, putting limitations on people, um, enforcing laws that weren't on the books, for example, selling rifles or liquor to Indians. But Reconstruction, they never called it martial law. They called it Reconstruction. So as far as declaring martial law, no Congress, to the best of my knowledge, has never declared it, and I don't think that they will. Now let's go one step further. I don't believe that there's a provision in the Constitution that would allow them to declare martial law. In fact, specifically, the Posse Comitatus Act uh, prohibits it, but then... That doesn't always stop the government because um, we had the Civil War, we had Korea. We have a lot of violations of the Constitution, so it's not, uh, it would be false to presume that they couldn't declare it. But there, I, I can find no authority anywhere that, th that it can be legally done, lawfully done, I should say. Kind of follow up with that, can martial law be declared by the federal government, if they so chose, as well as by state and local governments? Well, by that provision, I, I wrote uh, Article one, or Article 4, Section one, uh, 4, Clause 1, the United States shall guarantee to every state in the Union a Republican form of government and from uh, protect, uh, shall protect each of, from invasion and an application of the legislature uh, or the executive against domestic violence. Presumably, by that clause, now it would depend also on the state constitution, uh, whether the state constitution gave it authority, but presumably, absent uh, a uh, denial of that authority, that the state could uh, declare martial law under certain circumstances, but then they can also declare an emergency in most states as well. But we have 50 states, and each of those would have to be looked into their constitution uh, to see... Uh, whether they could declare martial law, uh, law or not. But presumably, if they saw the need to, they would do so. Well, Gary, let's get a little bit more into the nuts and bolts of this. Uh, you mentioned some documents earlier. And so let's, let's, let's just examine this just a little bit deeper. Was the Trading with the Enemy Act of 1917 a declaration of martial law? No, actually, it was very far from it because it dealt with trading with the enemy. Primarily, it dealt with trading with the enemy. There's a uh, link number one, if we can get our sergeant at arms to post it. Uh, uh, it goes into detail about what happened in 1917. And uh, the concern was that there were people that were doing business with the Germans. Well, we were involved in... in uh, war with the Germans in Europe. And so it was, you don't sell the enemy rifles and bullets when you're at war with them, but war profiteers will sell it to the highest bidder whenever they can. There's a tendency uh, in life for people to uh, do such things. But 
as far as martial law, no, it was a declaration of an emergency and was dealing with that emergency. And again, there was no implementation of military in the enforcement in anything in the War Powers Act of 1917. Okay, what was um, what was reported in that 1973 Senate report? Uh, was it an indication that martial law had been declared? No, again, it was uh, a reference to uh, national emergencies that had been declared and uh, were, according to the committee report, had not been uh, removed, but they were not martial law because we did not have military enforcement inside the United States to it. Now, going on in that document, these proclamations give force to 470 provisions of federal law Dele, uh, delegate to the president extraordinary powers ordinarily exercised by Congress, confer enough authority to the president to rule the country without reference to normal constitutional process. But his tools are the FBI, the BATF, US, U.S. Marshal Service, deputized local people, as we saw in Waco and, and subsequently, uh, is not military force. So is it martial law? No, it's not. Is it a violation of the Constitution? 470 provisions of federal law delegate extraordinary powers to the president without, uh, in some cases, uh, well, ordinarily exercised by the Congress. It's not martial law. It is a police state. It's it, it, Actually, it's uh, a, a shift towards a monarchy. Now the... Uh, uh, the king can do no wrong in those 470 provisions. It's a single man's decision, contrary to the concept behind the Constitution, with separations of powers. Um, but it's still, it's not martial law. It's not good, and we need to watch it, that encroachment. We need to watch the water boil. When it gets to a certain temperature, we better realize we better get out of the water or it's going to boil with us in it. But we're not looking for a landmark declaration, front page of the New York Times, martial law declared, because it will never happen. Wow, just wow. Okay, so if the government will never declare martial law, then why does the patriot community continue to worry about it? Well, we did uh, a discussion on behind enemy lines called Line in the Sand, which isn't posted at the OPF radio site yet, but it will be in the near future. And uh, it's, it's a line in the sand. We're looking for a landmark. We're looking for something to tell us it's time to do something. Uh, the problem with looking for martial law is if it's never going to come, that police state will sweep over us and the water will boil. So we've got to get our eyes off of uh, a target that will not occur uh, and stop worrying about that and look at what's happening around us. Look at the left hand, not at the right hand, because the right hand will never show what's happening. Wow, I'm, I'm just absolutely blown away by that. Uh, and I didn't quite think of it that way before, but now that you explain it, that, that makes a lot of sense that it's uh, just an excuse to keep delaying uh, actions that would actually help to secure our liberties. So I guess before we go to break, um, is martial let's, laws... Wait, let's not call it an excuse. Let's call it a misconception. It's not an excuse. Uh, people are hoping that there's a sign in the sky or something that causes them to act. Uh, so it's not an excuse. It's more of uh, an easy way out to look for something to uh, to say it's time. Uh, let's look look at this misconception or misunderstanding of the circumstances and what's happening in this country. Okay. Okay. I I, I stand corrected. Okay, a misconception then. All right. So before we go to break, then I guess I should ask: Is martial law then a serious concern at all? Well, if they were going to declare it, yes, definitely it would be. But, uh, you know, what we're trying to lay out in this program is the fact that it's ludicrous to, to pursue that as a goal. If it did happen, hey, then we would react to it as we anticipate we would if they declare it. But as long as we look at that as the goal, um, 
we're fooling ourselves. So if they did declare martial law, it would be a serious concern. However, an even more serious concern should be the encroaching police state that is daily, almost, at least while Congress is in session, expanding that uh, police state. Look at the federal government encroaching on the right to keep and bear arms uh, that's going on right now. And it's not a matter of when they come to get your guns, because when they come to get your guns from you in your house, that will be your last stand. Your, that will be your only stand. Uh, we need to be fully aware of what's happening now and uh, begin preparing to deal with that. So we're going to go to break now. Yes, yes. Just as the uh, police in my neighborhood are coming by, it's all too appropriate. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to go to a break, and uh, we'll be right back. Good Talk Radio takes a lot of effort to make it successful. It is truly a labor of love to bring high-quality episodes of OPF Radio to your digital music player. However, we do need to meet our operating expenses. We are completely independent media who are entirely supported by our listeners. So we are not beholden to either corporate special interests or unscrupulous advertisers who would use us to push their products. If you believe in our mission to bring original and useful material to the Patriot community, please consider making a donation today. Thank you so much for making this outreach effort worthwhile for all of us. And we are back, ladies and gentlemen, with this episode of OPF Radio, and we are talking about martial law. And Gary, I am just, I, I, I'm absolutely flabbergasted about what you are mentioning about martial law and the misconceptions that surround it. So before we continue on, just want to let everybody know we are at this time taking uh, questions and calls. If you want to call in, uh, the call-in number is area code 530-576-5790. One more time, that is area code 530-576-5790. And just in case you didn't catch that, our awesome Sergeant Arms will post that in the chat room. Or if you have Skype, you can just make a uh, Skype to Skype request uh, to OPF Radio, and uh, they will, and the Control Board will bring you on. And while we wait for those wonderful questions, comments, and uh, calls, let's continue on the same line of thought. Then, Gary, is there any form of a partial martial law? There, there could be. Uh... There was a kind of martial law in Baltimore during the time the, the military was posted throughout looking for spies and things like that, but they were dealing with dealing with spies and people. Boston was pretty sympathetic with the South. Maryland probably would have seceded had certain things not occurred. Uh, so there was kind of a partial uh, martial law imposed on Baltimore only, not all of Maryland. Uh, it, it could be, but again, it would have to be declared and it would have to be military rule. Now, the military rule in Boston was limited to people who were suspected spies, uh, suspected collaborators with the enemy, uh, did not affect normal people doing nor their, their normal daily business. So uh, there has been a form of martial law that was not declared by the uh, Congress that but was implemented uh, under the authority of the president uh, only in that one city during the Civil War. Well, hmm. Okay, well then, would the alternative media have anything to gain by stressing the threat of martial law? Attention? <laughs> um, I hard to answer. I mean, uh, yeah, let's look at it another way. Uh, would they have anything to gain by claiming the Martians were coming? 
maybe some level of sensationalism, a carnival-like atmosphere, perhaps. I I don't know. I mean, it's it's, it's it just seems a little bit odd to me. That's all. Attention. You know, if we look at history, martial law has not been declared. If we look what's happening in this country today, martial law is not being declared. It's not even close to being uh, declared. If we look at the 470 provisions that were talked about in 1973, I think that we could probably multiply that by a factor of 5 or 10 to, uh, uh, you know, 2 to, to 5,000 uh, provisions of the Constitu- uh, uh, provisions in, in acts of Congress have uh, transfer to the, the president certain executives of, of authority that is extra constitutional. Uh, so maybe we need to start looking at the sacred document called the Constitution and what uh, has happened to it. And if our Constitution is being decimated slowly a little at a time, isn't that boiling water? Uh, if it is, Maybe it's time for us to restore constitutional government. And that would be uh, to the uh, keeper of the chat, number five uh, and number four. But unless we decide to do something, that police state is going to overwhelm us to the point that the Constitution has become a piece of scrap paper is being chopped at a bit at a time. It's been chopped at since 1917. It was chopped down a little bit, but that was restored after Reconstruction back in the 1800s. But it's being decimated slowly. And our concern should be the decimation of the Constitution. It should not be. Uh, waiting for martial law to be declared so we know it's time to act. The time to act, when you start getting little cuts on you, is when you get little cuts on you. It's too late to act when they cut your head off. It's uh, Don't look for martial law. Look at what's happening around you. As I said, it's time for us to declare martial law against the government, perhaps. Well said. All right, so then if the government is in fact not going to declare martial law ever, then why do they continue encroaching on our rights? To avoid having to declare martial law. <laughs> that, that is the whole point. Why Hitler never declared martial law. He didn't have to. He just undermined their constitution. He granted himself the authority to do things. He got legislative approval for some, others he assumed. And he just kept going and going and going. He built a police force. We have over a million men in law enforcement in this country, a state, not federal, law enforcement in this country, over one million people. If they're deputized, that's a, a, a civil force, not martial law force, but a civil force. This been deputized to enforce the laws. And those laws, without martial law, have been enacted by the legislative or under the authority of the legislative branch of government by delegating to the president those authorities that he should never have had by the Constitution. Well, so. let's just, okay, well, let's just entertain the thought just for a moment that if martial law were officially declared, uh, what would we expect, realistically speaking? For example, uh, would there be military checkpoints laced with concertina wire and soldiers asking for our papers? Well, if we, we were under martial law, yes, there definitely would be. We would see concertina wire checkpoints. Uh, we would see them walking down the street. We would see them going to houses or businesses where they were, had a concern and, and dragging people out and throwing them in without due process in camps kind of like Red Dawn, except done by the United States military rather than the Russian military, uh, we would, that would be the indication that we were under martial law. But let's go back to what we're talking about. What do we see now? We see people arrested for just no crime, really. I mean, they're just arrested sometimes. And, and uh, there's an alleged crime, but it hasn't met the criteria of having a grand jury indictment or anything. We see property being taken all the time. 
uh, back to, to arrest it. Go flip a, the, a, a cop the bird and he'll arrest you even though he knows that you have a right to flip, flip the bird at him. Um, they steal property from pe- people in violation of the state and federal constitutions. Um, we have checkpoints. They don't have concertina wire, but we have the checkpoints. We're being conditioned to accept, let's call it a civil implementation of martial law, which means it's not martial law. It's a simple, sim- civil implementation of a police state. It emulates martial law. However, the government is still the executive, legislative, and judicial branches of government rather than a general. Okay. Well, as we uh, kind of start uh, winding down a little bit, just want to remind uh, the audience that if you want to ask a question, especially if you want to call in, uh, please do so now. That phone number again is area code 530-576-5790. One more time. Area code 530-576-5790. Or alternatively, if you have Skype, uh, put your uh, username in the chat room, and uh, it'll, and then we can bring you on. Or you can just look for OPF Radio on Skype and make a contact request, or just simply or, type your questions into the chat room. Or if you do want uh, want to come in on a call in call, but uh, that would be a toll call for you, and you don't have Skype, uh, you could leave your phone number in the chat, and our control panel will call you and bring you into the conversation. Yes. All right. Well, let's continue on while we wait for those. Um, would surveillance be increased under martial law? Oh, I got to think about that. Could surveillance be increased beyond what it is now? We now have drones in the sky. They'll be putting machine guns on them in the near future, and then maybe rockets after that. And see, that's <laughs> there. We go. Uh, this is not a martial law enacting with the, the drones, this is police state. So the difference is we don't have military government. We have a civil government, the one under the Constitution, even though it's violating that con- very Constitution. Uh, but we're getting, uh, how much more surveillance can you get? They use surveillance. The, apparently the FBI used some, uh, borrowed some tricky surveillance equipment from the uh, military in that thing in South Alabama where Dykes had that five-year-old kid in a bunker with him. And they were able to see in there, and, and apparently uh, uh, Dykes, uh, from what I've heard on the news, Dykes didn't even know that he was being surveilled at that. So if they can borrow it from the military, again, they did it at Waco, uh, they were using military equipment for surveillance and, you know, the heat sensing stuff that was available back in 93. Uh, but again, the difference is mil- martial law is military government. Uh, police state is civil government. And we've got the civil government. And there's not much more they can do with regard to surveillance than what they're doing right now. They can tap your phones under the FISA. If they assume that you're talking to foreigners about something uh, that might be terrorist related. Uh, the NDAA expanded certain authorities. Um, they can't open your mail now, except from what I understand, uh, they can unfold up to seven pieces of paper still in the envelope by using light. And then this the logarithm that actually unfolds the paper and separates the sheets based on the characters on them and the relationship. So the surveillance exists in this country. Uh, uh, Tim McVeigh, when he quoted that uh, court case, uh, that was about surveillance since they didn't have telephones when they wrote the Constitution and excluded uh, uh, telephones from the, the right to privacy uh, to, to, be, to be secure in your home. The government didn't need uh, to comply with the Constitution to tap phone calls. And that's just grown since back in the, the 30s when that happened. Okay, so let's let's try and just I don't know. There's there's something in my mind, Gary. That I, I I'm trying to figure out how to way to explain it. Just about how it comes up in conversations I have with folks. I guess the best way to put it is, where did the Patriot community get the idea 
of what they think martial law is? Uh, I have no idea. Um, you know, it's hard to say because, you know, I've heard it back in the in the 80s. And so I started looking into it. And like I say, it was being talked about when Gene Schroeder wrote an article back in uh, uh, the 90s. And I talked to Gene on the phone, got his article, got some of his research paper. It was back in 94. And talked with him, and I don't recall Gene calling it martial law, but everybody was calling it martial law at the time. Uh, and it had to do with the bankruptcy of the United States, and or actually to forestall bankruptcy by keeping the gold in, uh, the 1933 Act. But somehow it's picked up a momentum, martial law, it's a nice flowing thing to say, I guess. And so people have used it as a benchmark uh, that probably shouldn't properly be used as such. We need to be honest with ourselves about what is going to happen. And as long as we pursue this goal of martial law, we are setting ourselves up to be imposed upon by a police state, and we won't even know it until it's way too late. Okay, so uh, I'm trying to think of the takeaway from this then. Would it be accurate to say, or that the upshot of all this is that martial law is nothing more than a myth? I think that uh, that might be an appropriate way of describing it, yes that it is a myth that's propagated in, through the Patriot community uh, and the consequences of that myth uh, are basically we have dropped our guard. Our guard is down because we're waiting for something to happen that will never occur and we're not looking at what's happening around us now. Um, <laughs> there's a lot of things happening and, and I'm going to throw some numbers out for the the for Cav to put in there, 12 and 13. Um, Sons of Liberty 14, a link he's going to put up, talks about our relationship with government and what to do if the gov government breaches that contract that created them, which is called the Constitution. Uh, there's another one following that, Sons of Liberty 19, which talks about the value of freedom. And we need to consider what freedom is worth. Now, I think a lot of people don't understand what freedom is. But we need to, to understand its value at least. And uh, then we need to start looking at other aspects. And, and speaking of police state, there was an excellent article written a while by uh, Roger Roots called Our Cops Constitutional. And that's number 10. Um, if you understand what cops used to be and what they are right now, if you look at what's happening... Uh, if you if you get a tear in your pants and it gets a little larger each day, you really don't notice it until your knee sticks out, I guess. Uh, we got to realize that our knee is sticking out. When you read our cops' constitution, you'll, you'll find out that the implementation of the police state has all the appearances of a military state now uh, with the equipment and everything, but the civil government is still there. So we don't have a declaration of uh, martial law. Uh, we don't have de facto martial law, but we, in a way, really do have martial law in this country today. Now, there's another one, number nine, that talks, uh, what do we do and when do we do it, that you might want to consider. Um, there's another, uh, that's number nine. Uh, number eight, the three boxes. We think that we've got, this, this, this goes back to the Constitution, the decimation of the Constitution, uh, the three boxes, and I leave the uh, soapbox off uh, intentionally from that article, um, nine and eight, Kev. Um, we've got the jury box and the ballot box, and they've both failed us, and we've seen that with the way Ron Paul and his supporters were treated in the last primary. Uh, we've lost it in the jury box because we no, ever, no longer have a light, right to uh, judge the law as well as the fact. Uh, 
And uh, we've seen that justice is, uh, the evidence is controlled by the judge, who can testify is controlled by the judge. So we've lost the ballot box and the, and the jury box, and that leaves only the ammo box. And we need to start contemplating that the last box is our last refuge before uh, we are completely under a totalitarian state. Uh, if we look back at the Revolutionary War, we think that Lexington and Concord began it all. Number six, Kev, uh, the end of the revolution and beginning of independence for a year prior to Lexington and Concord. Guns were out. Tens of thousands of guns were out, pointed at the British. They didn't start shooting. It's not like today. We have so many cops now that if, if uh, 10,000 uh, patriots grabbed a rifle and went to a county seat and told the judge to resign, there would be a war starting right there. Back then, that happened over and over and over again. The playing field was different. We have to understand that that playing field is different. That's number six, Cav. So... We need to start thinking what we need to do to restore constitutional government, not keep waiting for some fictitious sign to pop up and say, okay, it's time to go. This will not start like a horse race. This will start more like deer hunting. And it's important that we understand that and get rid of this uh, fallacy, this myth, they're going to declare martial law, and then we know it's time to start fighting. So if I'm hearing, so if we're hearing you correctly, then it's not like the big kickoff point as if it's, say, Lexington and Concord, 1775. It's going to be more of a slow uh, ramp up then. Well, it's going to be a slow ramp up. Excuse me, excuse me, is, is a slow ramp up. <laughs> um, it has been a slow ramp up for quite some time. And we can go back to the Civil War and, and the 14th Amendment in particular, where a tool was given to the federal government to begin treating all of us as federal citizens subject to the federal, not the state government. Um, the ramp was at a very slight incline at that point, but that ramp is getting awful damn steep right now. In fact, it's approaching straight up. And we're going to fall off unless we jump off and start doing something about it and bring that ramp down, back down to where it's supposed to be. Wow. Okay, so just to clarify then, so is the real threat the police state and not this mythical notion of a declaration of martial law then? Yes, and the damage has been done, and you're sitting here waiting for the damage to start. The damage has been done. Uh, it continues, don't get me wrong. It's not over with, but it escalates, and we see that constantly. Um, All right. Oh, sorry. We have from a non- 5207. What if the dollar is how will they keep societal order? Um, I don't believe the dollar is going to collapse, quite frankly. Uh, it looks like it is. It's, it looks like it's on the, the top of a very high cliff. But what we're seeing implemented all the time, um, Social Security is going to stop issuing checks. They're only going to do electronic transfers now. I don't know how that's going to work if somebody doesn't have a bank account. We'll talk about that on another show. Uh, electronic currency is nice because it's manipulable. Uh, if the government, if you've got $100,000 in your electronic bank account and the government says, we don't want you to have $100,000 in your electronic bank account, they push a button and your $100,000 disappear. What we're seeing is something, I, I believe, is something that is going to force us into acceptance of electronic currency uh, because most people don't have wheelbarrows anymore and there's no way to take enough money down to buy a loaf of bread without a wheelbarrow, which happened in Europe after World War I. Um, 
I think it's a well-designed plan to force transition to electronic currency. Now, we used to have M1, M2, and M3 as indicators in the financial market. Now we have M4 and M5. Now, I guess M6 and 7 and 8 are going to come along uh, sooner or later. But uh, the idea is uh, they're creating a cliff, uh, and then they're going to come and save us. And they're going to save us by giving us electronic currency, whether they call them dollars or whatever they call them. Uh, that we will find that uh, it will soon be that you will not be able to make purchases in a lot of places uh, unless you've got electronic currency. So that collapse that we're anticipating, uh, again, is something that we're looking for that probably won't happen. They're not that dumb. You know, (laughs) under the... uh, last few administrations, the debt has been going up at a nearly straight-up rate. Uh, that would be suicide if there wa- wasn't a, uh, a, a silver parachute on the other side or a golden parachute on the other side. Uh, I don't think they're dumb enough to allow an economic collapse like what happened in, uh, I think it was Argentina back in the 60s, uh, where the joke was, if you're going to take a bus, take some extra money because the fare might go up before you get there. It was called hyperinflation. Um, quantitative easing is a way to adjust the rate of inflation by restricting the flow of new cash into the marketplace. Uh, so they're controlling it. But it will get to a point that there it will have to be a solution. And I have no doubt that it's sitting on some congressman's desk right now just waiting for somebody that controls him to say, okay, it's time, submit that bill, and we'll convert to electronic currency. So all these landmarks we set for ourselves, uh, when we set a benchmark and say when the economy collapses, hell, it started collapsing five years ago. How far are we going to go? Let's deal with what happened five years ago. The economy is collapsing now. And before they pull that parachute out, let's do something about it. Let's not keep looking for the next step because they ain't dumb and they've thought of the next step and they will appease 90% of the people of this country when they say, okay, go down and get your um, uh, card at the local IRS or bank or somewhere and uh, they will transfer all your currency electronically onto it and you won't won't need pockets in your pants anymore. Yeah, and you see, that's <laughs> yeah, that's the thing, especially considering the, uh, the 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 notion of the full blown socioeconomic collapse. I mean, I, I mean, I'm a, I'm very well aware that if you consider it in a vacuum, uh, <laughs> it it would be mathematically impossible for the system to continue. However, I think what a lot of folks are missing, and even uh, libertarians who usually kind of uh, hype on, or harp on that particular theme is that you have to consider that the central bankers are literally magicians. So it wouldn't surprise me at all if they just kind of spread out the effects of hyperinflation or uh, or QE infinity or whatever to the point where it wouldn't totally tank the economy in the sense of uh, something you'd read in a piece of uh, survivalist, uh, like a survivalist novel, like a piece of fiction. Where you where the grid goes down, you know, et cetera. It's very, you know, since they're magicians, they would stretch it out, and thus the police state, the incremental police state uh, thing, would keep on going. Actually, we did have a question from the listener chat room, Gary. Is it possible that the government would implement or uh, could implement martial law without actually declaring it? Well, the distinction, again, requires a a military government. Uh, If Obama is willing to turn his authority over to the generals, uh, he is doing some cleaning up in the the higher-ranking officers, apparently. But no, uh, kings don't give up their power to generals, and I don't expect that we'll see a a, a true martial law here. We will strictly see the expansion of the police state, and... Uh, the continued flow of military equipment to local law enforcement and uh, full automatic weapons and body armor, full military uniforms, but they're still under civil authority. So we are not going to see martial law. It will not revert to military authority. They will not do – they've got the governors lined up. 
They've even got the sheriffs lined up, contrary to what the sheriffs say when they say they'll not come in and uh, violate the Second Amendment in my county. What's going to happen is uh, somebody from Department of Justice is going to call them and say, you know that $5 million in grants we give you every year, uh, you want to lose that? And the sheriff will say, no, we can't afford to lose that. We'd have to let half our staff go. Then you better let our people come in and take the guns. And I'm guessing that's going to happen with most of the sheriffs. There might be a, a few with courage that will stand up to it. But this implementation of the police state uh, is in full bloom right now. And that's the enemy. It's not a martial law. It's not going to be martial law. It's going to be so tight a police state that you can't turn without permission. And unless and until we do something about it, and when I say do something about it, you know, it's called take the initiative because that screws up the other guy's plans. If he's moving along one line and you disrupt that line somehow, he's got to back up, regroup, and come up with a new plan. But as long as his plan flows smoothly, he can anticipate reaction to it. It's an unanticipated reaction called us taking the initiative that uh, will put a stick in the spokes of what we see progressing across this country today. There was a a rather interesting, uh, Brandon, can't remember his last name right now, wrote a a short story, a a fiction one. He was talking about uh, getting the press to tell the truth and what was happening, and this is along the lines of the plan, uh, what was happening is people were going out and assassinating reporters who took the government side and lied to the people and would not give the truth of what was happening. Now, after a couple of those died, the other reporters realized something's wrong here. I'm not going to follow the government line because I want to go home to my family tonight. Uh, That, for example, is taking the initiative and forcing the press to be honest with us, not to feed us the government line, which they're doing on gun control. Interesting, uh, uh, information somebody sent me the other day, I think it was on MSNBC, and the, the article was, six out of ten Americans believe that we need gun control. And below that was a poll that showed that 71% were opposed to gun control. So the article says 60% are in favor of gun control. The poll shows the opposite. 71% opposed to gun control. But see, the press will still continue to feed that 60%, 6 out of 10 line, unless Matt Bracken, that's the guy. What I saw at the coup, yes, that was it. Uh, Thank you, Anon. Uh, Look that article up. It's on Western Rifle Shooter or something like that, Western Shooter. Um, What I Saw at the Coup by Matt Bracken. If you read that, hey, there's a plan that would put a stick in their spokes. It would take away their major source of appeasement to us. We're being appeased when the press tells us everything's okay, when it's not okay. We need the press to tell us it's not okay. And the way to do that is get rid of those people in the press that tell us it's okay and keep those people in the press that tell us it's not okay. And that's exactly what Matt Bracken's article is about. So I suggest you read it. Wow, I, I I just can't emphasize enough just how blown away I am uh, because I keep seeing in various areas of the alternative media uh, and on such websites like YouTube, I keep seeing all sorts of articles and podcasts and especially videos on the subject about another martial law alert or something like that. But since it would seem to be the case that martial that any declaration of martial law is indeed a myth, um, <laughs> but and it's really the Orwellian nightmare, a uh, a police state that's really the threat, then, yeah, I mean, at this point, I never, ever, ever want to see somebody mention about uh, martial law ever, ever again, since it would seem to be a myth. Uh, well, Gary, uh, any uh, final thoughts, closing statements, words to posterity? <laughs> well, uh, I'll say it again. Uh Unless and until we take the initiative, we can expect that we will go down the same path we are, and someday we'll look back and say, well, they never declared martial law. 
Okay. Well, again, Gary, I'd like to thank you for uh, coming on tonight and really clearing up the misconception that is the looming uh, declarations of martial law. Definitely appreciate it. Oh, you're welcome. All right, everybody. Uh, That's going to be it for this episode of OPF Radio. Join us next time. I believe it is approximately two weeks from today on February 18th, which is a Monday, uh, 9 Eastern, 8 Central. And I believe for that particular broadcast, we are going to do, I think it is social contract. Good night, everybody. I had a dream the other night that, well, I didn't understand. A figure walked in through the mist with a flintlock in his hand. His clothes were torn and dirty as he stood there by my bed. He took off his three-cornered hat, and speaking low to me, he said, We fought a revolution to secure our liberty. We wrote the Constitution as a shield from tyranny. For future generations, this legacy we gave. In this, the land of the free and home of the brave. The freedoms we secured for you, we hoped you'd always keep. But tyrants labored endlessly while your parents were asleep. Your freedom's gone, your courage lost, you're no more than a slave. In this, the land of the free and home of the brave. You buy permits to travel and permits to own a gun. Permits to start a business or to build a place for one. On land that you believe you own, you pay a yearly rent. Although you have no voice in saying how the money's spent. Your children must attend a school that doesn't educate. And your Christian values can't be taught according to the state. You read about the current news in a regulated press. And you pay a tax you do not owe to please the IRS. Your money is no longer made of silver nor of gold. You trade your wealth for paper so your life can be controlled. You pay for crimes that make our nation turn from God and shame. You've taken Satan's number. You've traded in your name. You've given government control to those who do you harm so they could burn down churches and seize the family farm and keep our country deep in debt. Put men of God in jail. Harass your fellow countrymen while corrupted courts prevail. Your public servants don't uphold the solemn oaths they've sworn. And your daughters visit doctors so their children won't be born. Your leaders send artillery and guns to foreign shores and send your sons to slaughter fighting other people's wars. Can you regain the freedoms for which we fought and died? Or don't you have the courage or the faith to stand with pride? And are there no more values for which you'll fight to save? Or do you wish your children to live in fear and be a slave? Oh, sons of the Republic, arise, take a stand, defend the Constitution, the supreme law of the land, preserve our great Republic and each God-given right, and pray to God to keep the torch of freedom burning bright. As I awoke, he'd vanished in the mist from whence he came. His words were true. We are not free, but we have ourselves to blame. For even now as tyrants trample each God-given right, we only watch and tremble, too afraid to stand and fight. If he stood by your bedside in a dream while you were asleep and wondered what remains of the freedoms he'd fought to keep, what would be your answer if he called out from the grave? Is this still the land of the free?